What's the meaning of drink offering? Being a drink offering, that's a topic for tonight, uh, for you in the daytime. And we're going to look at Old Testament and realize that in Old Testament, a drink offering was poured out upon the sacrifice. Uh, whenever they offer a sacrifice, burnt offering, grain offering, whatever. In Numbers 28 chapter, verse 7 and 8, we read about this drink offering. There are many places in the Old Testament. I'm taking a couple, uh, only this particular verse. Same thing is mentioned in other parts of the New Old Testament, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. But Numbers read in 28 chapter, verse 7 and 8, when they offered a sacrifice on the altar, along with the animal sacrifice, a, a quart of a hin of wine, fermented wine, was poured out upon the altar, on the sacrifice, as a drink offering. That's, what, that's the meaning of drink offering in the Old Testament. It was a physical ritual being done. And we all know that the sacrifices those days were symbolic of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. The Passover lamb was symbolic of the real Passover lamb, who is Christ. So much so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul writes about Jesus. Jesus, our Passover lamb. He himself is a Passover lamb. So the Old Testament time, when the lambs and bulls are offered, they poured out a quart of a hint of wine as a drink offering along with the sacrifice. Now we know that the ultimate sacrifice was paid by Christ on the cross. So what's the significance of a drink offering along with the sacrifice? Now we all know that Christ, the Passover lamb, was the ultimate Passover lamb, spotless, blameless. See, the Old Testament time, they always chose an animal as a Passover lamb, which was spotless, without defect, Firstborn male without defect. And the without defect basically symbolizes in the New Testament a sinless person. And only Christ is sinless. And those sacrifices those days could never take away sin. It's only an annual reminder of the sins of mankind. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4 says the animal sacrifice. It was impossible put to take away sin. But they were only symbolic of the real sacrifice of Christ. So when Christ entered the world, he told the Father in heaven, Hebrews chapter 10 from verse 5 onwards, sacrifices and burnt offerings you didn't desire. But a body you prepared for me. Here I am. I've come to do your will. God never wanted animal sacrifice. Those days. He only was looking forward to the perfect sacrifice of Christ. But since Christ had not yet come, those days, those sacrifices were symbolic of the ultimate sacrifice. And when Christ entered the world, he said, Here I am. I've come to do your will. And Hebrews 10 10 says, By that will, we have been made holy to the sacrifice of the body of Christ. Once and for all. Hebrews 10, 14 says, By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now, he has made mankind perfect by his blood. And that sacrifice was actually for the sins of the whole world. Not just for some people. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, John writes, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, for the sins of the whole world. For every human being in the world, he was crucified. Also, it says in 2 Peter 3 9, he doesn't want anyone to perish, all to come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, he wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, this sacrifice was for the sins of the whole world. And on the cross, Jesus, after living a sinless life, he told the Father, 
it is finished. Meaning the sacrifice for the sin of the whole world was accomplished on the cross for all mankind. Now, till such time, everybody in the world comes to know about this sacrifice for them. Something is lacking in that sacrifice. So you read in the Bible, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, Paul writes, Colossians 1, 24, he writes, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking the sufferings of Christ for the sake of the church which I am a servant. I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking sufferings of Christ for the sake of the church. What is lacking sufferings of Christ? He died for the whole world, for mankind. Till such time, this good news reached to everybody, something is lacking in the purpose of the sacrifice. And the Apostle Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. I go forth with this gospel to wherever God sends me. And in that process of going here and there, I get persecuted, I get trouble, I get beaten up by people, beaten with rods, all kinds of sufferings I face. I fill up in my flesh. To the Galatians he wrote, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. So he went on with the gospel to ensure as many people hear the gospel, because still such time everyone hears the gospel, something is lacking in the accomplishment of Christ on the cross. He has done his part. How can people call upon his name unless they hear that name? In Romans chapter 10 from verse 13, Paul writes, Romans 10, 13, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call upon the one they have not believed? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? And Paul knew fully well he was sent. He was an apostle. Apostle means sent forth. Apostolos. He was a servant of God, offered himself as a slave to Christ, and God told him, you be my apostle. So as he went forth with the gospel, with zeal, with love and compassion, he realized he's being poured out like a drink offering. The ultimate sacrifice was made by Christ on the cross. Along with that sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, he wanted to be a drink offering poured along with Christ for the sake of the people to hear the gospel. He emptied himself. Look at the life of the Apostle Paul. He's the one person in the New Testament who says, I am a drink offering. Nobody in the New Testament among the apostles ever said, I am like poured like a drink offering. That means along with the sacrifice of Christ, I go about fulfilling the purpose of the sacrifice sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with zeal, with love and compassion. Paul realized he is a debtor to people. He says to, to Corinthians, he wrote, 1 Corinthians 9.16, Woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe unto me if I don't share the gospel. He realized he is a debtor to mankind and he can't keep quiet about this gospel. And he poured himself out like a drink offering along with Christ's sacrifice to make sure that the purpose of sacrifice reaches as many people as possible. So in other words, when we are involved in the mission of evangelism, we are called to pour ourselves out for the sake of people. To become a servant of people because we serve God. We all know that in the kingdom of God, a leader is a servant leader the servant. Paul not only understood that, he preached that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. He writes, We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. He realized that he's called to share the gospel, and the motivation to share the gospel was the love of God. 
is I'm compelled by the love of God. 2 Corinthians 5.14 The love of God constrains me. When you love God, you obey Him. When you love Jesus, you obey His teachings. John 14.23 Also, we will serve people out of love for God. And the Apostle Paul preached that. We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. So we are called to be servants of the people we minister to. Not Lord to those entrusted to us. But be an example to the flock. In Romans 1.14 he writes, I am obligated to both Jews and Greeks. Obligated. I am a debtor. That, that's how he had that passion to communicate gospel. Because still, such time people hear about the gospel, something is lacking. That's one reason why the Lord has not yet come a second time. In 24th chapter of Matthew, verse 14, Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the end of the world, will testify to all nations, then the end will come. Then the end will come. So the key to be a drink offering is loving God and therefore loving people and taking the ministry very, very seriously, realizing that he wants all nations to hear the gospel. It's not going to come a second time till everyone hears. And we are God's instruments to ensure they hear the gospel. We are responsible for people to accept Christ. We are responsible for their salvation. That between them and God. We are responsible for being faithful to the gospel. We are obligated to people to share the gospel with them. It's written in the Bible about the church in Ephesus when it began. There are 12 people in Ephesus, and Paul went there. He asked them, You receive the Holy Spirit when you believed. And they say, We already heard there's the Holy Spirit. And what baptism did you receive? Paul asked them. John's baptism. And in chapter of Acts, verse 6, Paul prays for them. There are 12 people. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to meet every day in Ephesus, in the lecture hall of Tyrannos. And Acts 19, chapter verse 10 says, In this way, all the Jews and Greeks in the province of Asia heard the word of God. They heard. Doesn't say necessarily accept the word of God. Doesn't say they became believers. They heard the word of God. Our calling is to ensure people get to hear the gospel and have the opportunity of responding to the gospel. That's all. Drawing them to Jesus is God's doing, not our doing. But we are called to create awareness of the claims of Jesus about himself. And the Apostle Paul very clearly says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking, the sufferings of Christ. He suffered for the sins of the whole world. And therefore, in our own environment, we are called to be faithful to the gospel wherever God sends us. And this zeal for the gospel, in the case of Apostle Paul, came from his love for God. God's love compelled him. Now, how does God's love with some people is so much, some people less? Why some love God more, some love God less among Christians? We find the answer in a little uh, example Jesus gave, a true story actually. When he went to Pharisee's house, and then there was a lady who came there, they found in the book of Luke, sorry, uh, uh, chapter 7, Verse 47, I'll come to that. But uh, Luke 7 chapter, from verse 43, we read a story about Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house and a lady comes there to that house and she comes quietly, comes behind Jesus. She wets his feet with her tears and wipes his feet with her hair. The Lord looks at this. She doesn't speak one word. Just by action, she showed how much she loved him. And, the Pharisee, and he tells the Pharisees, 
Her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. Without speaking one word, she just came there and showed a devotion to Christ, wiping his feet with her tears, uh, uh, wetting his feet with her tears, wiping it with her hair. And the Lord noticed that and told the Pharisees, who thought, if he was a prophet, he'll know what kind of woman this is. They were thinking, if he was a prophet, you would have known what kind of woman this is. The Lord knew what they were thinking. And he says, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. He who is forgiven little, loves little. Luke 7, 47. He who is forgiven little, loves little. What does it mean? The flip side. He who is forgiven more, loves more. When what realizes how much he has been forgiven, you love God that much more. This is the reason why people who had died in very bad sins before, bad sins in the eyes of people, in the eyes of God, sin is sin. But we have our own classification of sins. The people have done very grave sins. Like those days, they looked down upon prostitutes and tax collectors. They thought they were very, very bad people. The Pharisees thought they were very good people. Their classification of sins. And Jesus says, prostitutes and tax collectors, I had entered the kingdom of God, I had a all of you. They realize how much they've been forgiven. This lady must have lived a sinful life in that town. She understood how much she's been forgiven. She loved Jesus that much more. So let's come back to the Apostle Paul. When he did not know Jesus, he was a violent man, persecutor, a blasphemer. He wrote to Timothy about that. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Even though he was a violent man, Persecutor, blasphemer, have shown mercy because act of ignorance. Act of ignorance. And unbelief. They have shown mercy. He wrote to Titus about his past life. Titus chapter 3, from verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, instead by all kinds of passions and desires, living in malice and envy being hated and hitting one another. But in the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things were done, but because of mercy. He saved us the washing of rebirth, renewed by the Holy Spirit. Paul never forgot his past, but in a positive way, not a negative way. Not with a feeling of guilt, but with an attitude of thankfulness for God, for salvation, for grace. Grace, mercy, and salvation. He realized how much he had been forgiven. How he was persecuting Christians and misleading the Jews. If you look at the 11th chapter of um, uh, Romans and 9th chapter of Romans, we read about how he had so much of uh, compassion for the Jews. He said, I, I wish I must have been cut off from Christ for sake of my brethren, the Jews. They have zeal. They're zealous for God. But zeal is not based on knowledge. And he says, what, an amazing, what a statement is making. I wish I was cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren. Because he must have realized, apart from persecuting Christians, he was misleading the Jews. He was a big leader, persecuting Christians, and leading a number of Jews along with him as a leader to go and persecute Christians. And I suspect that many of those Jews didn't actually give their life to Christ. Possible. And Paul must have felt so bad. He was a leader for them, convincing them to persecute Christians. He's become a believer. They have not. And he said, I wish I was cut off for the sake of these people. They are zealous for God, but it is not based on knowledge. Romans chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, he writes, So they do not write this and come from God. They sort of accept their own righteousness. Christ, the end of the law, I have a righteousness in him for everyone who believes. He must have felt so bad how much he misled the Jews, how much he pursued Christians. I mean, realize how much he had actually hurt God, he was persecuting Christ, not Christians. He thought he was doing a favor to God by persecuting Christians. But the Lord, when he introduced himself to Saul, must have shocked Saul. He asked Saul a question. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Not my people, not my believers. 
not my disciples. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? These are not the whom we are persecuting. How much he very much have felt. Then he says, what should I do, Lord? Acts 22nd chapter verse 10. What should I do? And that point of time began a wonderful mystery of grace and mercy from God, the life of the Apostle Paul. So I believe his love for God was proportional to him realizing how much he had been forgiven. This is one reason why many people have a very bad past, totally a past away from God, terrible past. When they turn to Christ, they love God that much more. He was forgiven little, loves little. He was forgiven, he knows how much he had been forgiven, will love God that much more. It's important for us to realize that when Adam and Eve committed one sin, they were cut off from God. One sin. The very first sin. They must have been more sins after that. But one act of discipline was sufficient for them to be cut off from God. How many sins we keep on committing in thought, word, and deed. But once and for all, the cross, Christ has paid the price for us. When you understand that, we will love God more and more. And we love God, we will serve God. We want this gospel to go to as many people as possible. And that love will compel us, constrain us, for us to become a drink offering. Along with the sacrifice of Christ, a sacrifice for the sake of people. A drink offering being poured out. Poured out for the sake of people. And in the process, face every trial and suffering because of the gospel. Look at the way the Apostle Paul suffered for the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 11 chapter, we read about how he faced so much of persecution. Also, 2 Corinthians 6 chapter 8 to 10 we read. And he writes 11 chapter of the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11 chapter about how he faced all kinds of difficulties. Five times he was given the 40 lashes minus one. Three times beaten with rods, once uh, a stone, three times shipwrecked, in danger from bandits, danger from the Jews, danger from believers, from unbelievers, in the sea, in the land, hunger, thirst, sleepless nights, so much of suffering he had. But he faced, went through all that with the zeal to keep on serving God in spite of persecution. In Second Corinthians, 6th chapter, 8 to 10, again talks about experience he went through in the ministry. Remember this in the context of being poured out like a drink offering for the sake of the people, for the sake of the gospel, to make sure they get to hear the gospel. 2nd Corinthians 6th chapter, 8 to 10, he writes, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine, it regards imposters, Dying, yet we live on. Beaten, yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. He went through all those trials because he realized he's obligated to people. Obligated Jews and Gentiles. Romans 1.14 he says, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. Woe unto me. Woe in the Old Testament actually was a curse. First Corinthians 9.16. So when you have the attitude of realizing how much you've been forgiven, and in response we have to love him, and that love is manifested also in being servants of people, in blessing people. 21st chapter of Matthew, we read about how, uh, sorry, John, 21st chapter of John, we read about how uh, the Lord asked Simon, son of John, a question. Peter, Simon, do you love me more than this? John 21, 15. You know I love you, Lord. Feed my lambs. Do you love me? I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? I love you, Lord. Take care of my sheep. So being servants of people, blessing them, sharing gospel with people of other faiths, and building up Christians in the faith, is an expression of love for God. And that love will constrain us to pour ourselves out as a drink offering. 
And to end of his life, he rise to Timothy. We poured like a drink offering. Now the time has come for, the depart- for my departure to heaven. There's no limit to serving God. Sometimes we think I've done so much, how much more can I do? I'm facing difficulties in life. When you do it out of love for God, which comes from understanding how much he has forgiven you. He has forgiven little, loves little. You know how much you've been forgiven? You love God that much more. How much loving he is. Look at the blessings he has given us. If only we count the blessings he has given us, we start counting his blessings, Psalm 103 verse 2, we will lose count. We will stop counting up some time. Because so many blessings. So many blessings he has given us. We don't take time to stop and see how many blessings showered upon us. Seen blessings, unseen blessings, future blessings. So many blessings are there for us. Simply because he loves to bless us. When God made man, the Bible says the first thing he did was he blessed them. He made man his own image. Then this is 1, 26, 27. Even after creating man, he blessed them. The source of all blessings. Till Christ entered the world, for the Israelites, after they sinned against God, after mankind sinned against God, blessings were conditional. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. After Christ came and the grace and truth came to Jesus, in John 1.16, John writes, from the fullness of his grace, we receive blessing after blessing. We look at the past, realize who we were, how many sins we committed, who we were, and yet he died for us. Well, yet sinners he died for us. Then spontaneously, we will want to love him more and more. We remember our past not in a negative way, not with guilt, but with joy and thankfulness. I remember a time when I used to worship snakes in Chennai. I used to go uh, every Thursday to a particular place of worship. There was a snake pit there. Mother used to tell me that if I give milk to the snake, it will I'll be blessed. Every, every time I go with a small cutlery of milk, I try to give milk to the snake, which never came out of that particular snake pit. And I was very nervous. I thought, if the snake comes in, what do I do? And if I'm supposed to give milk. If I give milk, I'll be blessed, my mother told me. Every time I go there with my mother, I'll take a small cutlery of milk, try to give to the snake. The snake never came. I never gave milk, but I am blessed. Amazingly blessed today. Whenever I pass by that particular place of worship in Chennai, I look at that place and wonder, when I was in that place, trying to give, give milk to a snake, how my God must have felt. Worshipping the creation, worshipping things of this world, rather than living God. And only about 13 years later, he actually revealed himself to me. And God reminds me of the fact that I was blinded. I was in sin. While I was a sinner, he died on the cross. While people, mankind were sinners, he died on the cross. So therefore, our response to his sacrifice should be also offering ourselves as sacrifices. He wants our hearts, not our money, not our, our all the things we can acquire for ourselves. Joel 2.13 Render your heart, not your garments. So actually, not just serving God, pouring us out like a drink offering, a spontaneous response to loving God, to God's love for us. And it comes spontaneously because we realize He loves us with an everlasting love. And nothing can separate us from His love. In Romans chapter 8, 38, 39, we read, Paul writes, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, as the present or the future, nor anything else in all creation. But it separates from the love of God, Christ, which is in love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing will separate us. And that love is an everlasting love. Jeremiah 31 3, God says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. Please never question God about his love for us. Don't ever question God. Don't ask, argue with God or complain to God. His altogether love personified, God of compassion, mercy, and love. And just thank Him for that love. And 
thank him for the blessing he showered upon you. In response, offer yourself to God completely. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul writes, after talking about how he destroyed death on the cross, from verse 56 he writes, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives victory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand firm then, verse 58, let nothing move you. Give yourself fully to serve the Lord. For you know the labor in the Lord is not in vain. We labor in the Lord, not just work for the Lord. Laboring means also taking a beating. The word servant, very often used by the Bible in the New Testament for certain words, like Romans 1.1, 1, 1, I, Paul, a servant of Christ, actually is not servant, it's slave. Slave, doulos. Doulos in Greek means slave. I, Paul, a slave of Christ. A worker works, a slave labors. When you labor, it's equivalent to taking a beating. A slave takes a beating. We are slaves of Christ. Therefore, we are prepared to take a beating. In other words, difficulties in life, suffering in life, for the sake of the gospel. Because we want this gospel to go to the ends of the world as a desire of God. Till such time everyone hears that gospel, something is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. It seems very difficult to believe that, but that's what the Bible says. Colossians 1.24 I fill up in my flesh, Paul writes. Fill up in flesh, but I'm still lacking the sufferings of Christ. For which I become a slave, a slave, a servant of the gospel, servant of the church. So all of us today are also in the same situation. It's not yet come a second time. So we've got to be faithful to whatever God has called us to do. In the case of the Apostle Paul, he was an evangelist. That was his primary calling. So much so when he was taking leave of the Ephesian elders in a place called Miletus. He's going back to Jerusalem. He's in Miletus, calls for the Ephesian elders. He tells them, 20th chapter of Acts, we read about that. He tells them how he has to, he's going to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit warns him he's going to face a lot of difficulties. Everywhere suffering awaits him. Difficulties await him. He's been, he's been forewarned by the Holy Spirit. But he's going. And he writes in 24th verse, he tells them, written in Acts 20, 24. He writes there and tells the, the Ephesian elders, how I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying the gospel of God's grace. Nothing hinders him from that. Single minded focus on doing the will of God in that process, facing difficulties. 155 lashes. Five times 40 lashes minus one, which means so many lashes he got. Lash is not the ordinary lash. People have thorns in it. Flesh will come out. Three times he was shipwrecked. Three times beaten with rods. One stone. How many difficulties he faced? But he went through joyfully simply because he knew he the rewards in heaven. And if you look at the uh, sixth verse of 2 Timothy 4th chapter, which I quoted earlier, I'm already poured like a drink offering. Now time has come for my departure. Already drink offering is over. I offered myself a drink offering. Along with the sacrifice of Christ, I poured myself out for the sake of the gospel. Look at 7th and 8th verse. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now the store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge will grant to me on that day. Not only for me but all long for his appearing. When you long for his appearing, what do you do? You live a holy life and be busy involved in the communication of the gospel. In Philemon 6, it's written, Philemon 6, I pray that you be active in sharing your faith, that you have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Even to understand apart from manifesting, even to understand every good thing we have in Christ, we should be active in sharing our faith. And that motivation comes 
from love for God, which comes from understanding God's love for us, which comes from understanding how much we've been forgiven. He was forgiven little, love is little. He realized how much he'd been forgiven. He loved God that much more. This is why the Apostle Paul encouraged the church in Corinth to think about their past in a positive way, not a negative way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, he writes, Think of what you have in your core. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose to push in the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things to despise things. Things that are not only for things that are that no one can boast before. So such a joy for us to be poured out like a drink offering. I wonder if we'd like to tell God, Lord, I'm willing, Lord, to be a drink offering. In other words, I'll serve you, Lord, whatever it costs. And Paul says, my life is not worth nothing to me. I want to finish the task, complete the race. And of the rise, he says, Timothy, I finished the race. I've been already poured a drink offering. And now, there's store for me in the crown of righteousness. God grant me on that day. Not only for me, but all long for the appearing. You, all of us can have that crown of righteousness. To long for the appearing and get busy fulfilling his will. Forget about things of this world. They'll follow us. We follow Christ. We follow Christ. Goodness and knowledge follow us wherever we go. We have a shepherd whom we have to follow. When you follow him, we'll never be in need. Psalm 23 verse 1. What happens when you follow the shepherd? You won't be in need because goodness and mercy will follow you everywhere. But green pastures, still waters, even the valley in the shadow of death will follow you. Don't look at goodness and mercy. Look at the shepherd. Follow him and thank him for the amazing sacrifice he made for you on the cross. Never doubt his love. His love is not like human love, which can change. He himself says in Jeremiah 31 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. When people t- ask me, Brother, how can I draw close to God? I want to draw close to God. How can I draw close to God? You know what I tell them? Just remember his love for you. Remember his love for you that will draw you close to him. With the loving kindness, he draws us close to him. And nothing is separate from God's love. Loves it with an everlasting love, undiminished love. It's a constant. God is a constant. He never changes. He is love. He never changes. 1 John 4, 16, he is love. Malachi 3, 6, I, the Lord, do not change. So hold on to the unchanging love of God and serve him with wholehearted devotion. Now, moving right or left, and if you have the desire in your heart, tell him, Lord, I want to be a drink offering, pouring myself out to people, serve people out of love for you. Give me your wisdom, give me your strength. As I pray now, if you want, you can agree with me in prayer and say amen to it, wherever you are. Remember, make a commitment not just to serve him, but to pour us out as a drink offering. Not ever looking back, facing every consequence of being a servant of God, knowing fully well, he is your reward in heaven. In John 12, 26, Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Let's pray.